This message, whatever you want to call it, this room is my room. Maybe you can guess from the little story I told beforehand. This house is my house. This land is your land, famous song, this land is your land. By the way, we lost a real neat guy this week, stopping Tom Connors. Yeah. That boy could sing. Anyways, as a pastor, how do you talk, especially in church, about the very sensitive subject known as money? You know? Um, I'm actually not going to talk about tithing this morning. Everybody worries when pastor talks about money, he's going to talk about tithing. Don't worry. Okay? Keep your wallets closed at least until offering. But can you imagine if I got up here and I said, you know what, we're changing things. Um, I don't want you to tithe anymore. We're going to go for a, a fee per service kind of thing. You know, I'm installing um, uh, parking meters in the parking lot. You put in 25 cents for 15 minutes. And if you know that a real good evangelist is speaking, you gotta put in extra money. Okay, when you come in, you pay a dollar for the bulletin. If you wanna use the bathroom, that's $10. You make a lot of money on that, right? All kinds of things. If you wanna hear the worship team, you have to put on special headphones, because otherwise they're silent. No more tithing. Three percent, we make a lot of money doing that. But anyways, I'm not gonna talk about that. This series is called Money Talks. Today I want to give you the big, broad, mother of all truths as it relates to uh, your money. And if it relates to tithing, or if it relates to your financial freedom, or whatever you want to, uh, let the Holy Spirit take the message where it wants to take it with you this morning. Before you get up to leave right now, because you just found out I'm going to talk about money today, um, the application, I want to tell you, the take home, what you should walk out of the door with today, has nothing to do with giving your money uh, away. In fact, if you're willing to actually listen to what the Bible has to say about money, you are going to have more of it. Oh, I like that. I'm going to stick around now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm like reading about, you know, money this week, preparing for this message, and I'm like, whoo, I can do that. Now, here's what I know about all of us, okay, myself included. Every decision we make financially flows from something that we believe about money. The decisions we make financially are an overflow about what we believe about debt, investing, saving, purchasing. Um, how many of you, uh, for those of you who don't know, when I ask you to uh, put your hands up to a question, I really like it if you put your hands up, just so you know, okay? How many of you received an allowance as a child? Okay, you got, you know, maybe even a quarter, all right. I, you know what, I got an allowance as a kid for doing nothing, once a week on Friday, free money. I loved it, now you're debating whether or not you got an allowance, which is good. Uh, if you did chores and got money, it's not an allowance. Okay, if you got money for free, it was, anyways, the decisions your parents made regarding, um, how you handled money flowed from what they believed about money. But here is the mystery. If I asked you to tell me this morning about your financial decisions, you could show me your checkbook or your, your, your credit card statement. Um, that's easy because those are decisions. But if I ask the question, uh, what are your deeply held beliefs about money? Um, I should have more. Uh, my wife spends too much. Uh, our bills are too high. It's, it's easy to see our decisions because we know their outcomes. But it's much harder to explain what our deeply held beliefs are because it's hard to explain our deeply held beliefs about anything because we don't put as much study into that. Sure, if you, if you took the time to think about it, uh, and a couple weeks from now you were to come back and say, you know what, Pastor Ed, I thought about it and here's what I believe deep down. You might be able to, but we all have to know that our financial decisions, the decisions you make financially are an overflow of your deeply held belief about money. And if you don't know what those beliefs are, they can begin to crumble. 
And then if you want to change your financial outcome, and you don't know what your deeply held beliefs are about money, you're probably not going to be able to change your financial outcome. Some of you have driven yourself crazy because you don't like where you are financially. You've tried and tried and tried to change, but you haven't got down to the root of it, which is what do you believe? What are your deeply held beliefs about money? And the fact is changing your financial outcome in this life is not just about deciding and undeciding what to do with the money that you have. Do you know how big the money book section is at, uh, what is it, Chapters, that big bookstore across from Polo Park? Yeah. To the, the books just telling you what to do with your money? It's huge. But the, the crazy thing is those books about money, you have to spend money to buy one of them. <laughs> and it tells you what to do with your money. Very few of them, except for a couple that I know of, talk to you about your core beliefs about money. The Bible, though, is full of insight about money. Um, this guy, maybe you know him, Jesus. Um, many of you here know him personally. He spent a certain percent of his time talking about money. Now remember, Jesus talked about miracles and devotion and houses on a rock and houses on sand. So um, how much of his time did Jesus spend talking about money? 10, 15, give me a, give me a percentage. Anybody? 19. 19? 19? Do I hear another number? 10? I got 19 and 10. One more. One. What? 25. Yes. Almost. Jesus spent a quarter of his time talking in some way about money. That, that is a very high number. Now, if you, if you have your Bibles and they're still turned or tuned to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, good, keep them there. If not, head over to 1 Chronicles. Uh, First Chronicles can be tricky to find. If you have to use your index, that is not embarrassing whatsoever. So please find your way over to First Chronicles. Um, I'll put the scripture up like I usually do on the screen for you if you don't have your Bible. So no Bible, no problem. Back in the days of King David, okay, who was kind of king when this stuff was going on here in First Chronicles, the Jewish people believed that... Uh, that God resided in a, a tent kind of structure. This is a recreation of the tent uh, in Israel. Anybody know what that tent is called? Starts with a T, ends in abernacle. Tabernacle. Tabernacle. Very good. You guys are sharp today. Okay? The, the, uh, the Israelites believed that God resided in the tabernacle. It went with them, uh, you know, in a variety of places. And finally, when they when they stopped and began building the city of Jerusalem, you know, God resided in the tabernacle, uh, specifically in a, a very nice looking box called the Ark. Exactly. Uh, thank you for not making me do A finishes with Ark. I appreciate that. Um, and so, you know, they, they, King David and the Israelites believed that, uh, that this is where, where God was, and that's also where they kept the Ten Commandments. When the nation of Israel became established, they built the city of Jerusalem. Incredible city. They, uh, they built housing for everybody. They built a magnificent castle for, for indeed places of business every day. One day, David is wandering around his gazillion dollars by equivalence to today's money castle. And, he, and he, he looks out the window and he sees everybody's places to live. And then he, he looks out another window and he sees that... Uh, that, that God is living in a tent and a fancy box. And so he kind of starts getting this idea. You see, all the other surrounding nations have built magnificent temples to their gods. Huge temples to their gods. Which is kind of embarrassing if you think of it. I want you to imagine David gets a, a visit from another king. And uh, he's walking around the city, he's going... Wow, David, this is, a, this is an amazing city here. You guys are well off, you know? 
You've done good for yourself. You must have an incredible God in your palace. I mean, I don't have a palace like this. Your God must be amazing. Where do you, where do you keep your God? And David's like, um, well, uh, our, and we keep our, our God's out back. Oh, yeah? Well, can, we, can, can, can I go see him? Well, uh, sure. Where, where, where does he live? Well, he lives, he lives in a box in a tent. Your God lives in a box in a tent? Well, yeah, you know, our God's got this thing for camping, so we can let him have a tent. So David gets this idea, I'm going to build a huge temple, a glorious temple for my God, for our God. And he goes on this huge capital campaign, gets all the contractors and subcontractors in place. And while this is going on, God speaks to David and he says, you know what? I like what you're doing. I like the preparation. I like that you're raising funds, but I'm not gonna let you do the building. You can't build my temple because you have blood on your hands. You're a king that has been to war so often and you have, you have so much blood on your hands, I don't want a warrior king building the temple. You are, yes, a man after my own heart, but I, I will not allow a warrior king to build the temple. So his son Solomon uh, would build it. Now, you'd think David would be upset, but he wasn't. He knew exactly what God was talking about. And so he spent, David spent the rest of his life preparing for the construction of the temple, which ultimately his son Solomon would build. And sure enough, Solomon built the most amazing temple to God. Now, in this process of raising the money, raising money to build a church is tough enough, you know, today. Raising the money to build the magnificent temple that they were going to build. And in the process, David states this overarching truth that I'm going to get into with you right now. Uh, so let's read. Let's read this. With all my uh, resources... This is basically um, referring to, uh, you know, the, the riches of Israel, not David's personal stuff, okay? With all of, you know, uh, the resources that I have access to in Israel, I provided for the temple of God. Gold for the gold work, silver for the silver work, bronze for the bronze work. That makes sense. It would be kind of weird if he provided silver for the bronze work. Iron for the iron and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, the stones are very... Wow, this sounds kind of nice. Yeah. Wouldn't mind if Heart of Worship International Church would build that. You know, next to... All kinds of fine stones and marble, all in these large quantities. He says, guys, I want you to know I raised money. And I did so so that we can provide for the experts what they need. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God... I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver over and above everything I have provided. Listen up, everybody. I already reached into my big pile of gold and silver that's, uh, you know, mine as king. Now I'm going into my personal assets, my retirement fund. I'm going to give extraordinarily generously to this temple because this is a big deal. And then he asks the key question. Now who's willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? In other words, who's going to join me? Dramatic pause. You know, everybody gets rah, rah, rah when something's going on up here, yeah. right? You know, and then I was in the mouth of the... Can you imagine, like, Daniel, right? After he gets out of the lion's den and he says, Yeah, you know what? God saved me from those vicious lions. Now I'm going to jump back in again. And you're all like, All right, go for it, Daniel! And I go, Okay, who wants to come with me? <laughs> now, <laughs> David's going... I have just put millions, if not billions, into the temple. And all the Israelites are going, yes! And then David goes, all right, who's in with me? Oh. Now you think that might be their reaction, but let me read you their reaction. Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work 
gave, what's the word? Willingly. Willingly. Yes, let's do this. Let's get God out of the tent. David was so excited about this response. Listen to what he says. He, he praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying, Praise be to you, O God, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And now here is the money clue. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. I'm not reaching into my retirement account. I'm reaching into savings, your savings, the savings that belong to you. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom of heaven. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from? You, you are the ruler of all. all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. And basically, basically David is saying, look, God, you own it all. So you should decide who gets it and how much they should get of it. Verses 13 and 14. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? David was king. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Lord, what a privilege. You, you loaded us up so we can load you up. God, it's so amazing. You gave me all this wealth so I can give you all this wealth. I gave that guy in Hawaii my house so he could give me back my house. And in no way am I comparing myself to God. I've just 